so let me introduce the speaker while um, he's changing the changing the settings. So Nitin was formerly from IBM and he's been in blockchain for quite a while. He, in 2015, founded the IBM Blockchain Labs in Austin, Texas, and then moved on to found the Digital Assets Lab and done a lot of research in how can blockchain actually inform society? How can money of the future look like? And how can we actually think of digital assets as beyond money? He built the infrastructure for that. And as many of you know, also IBM is quite a big player in the IT sector. So today we have him with us so that we can learn about what actually do we learn from the ecosystem when we think of it in a very strategic way in a long-term perspective. So we are now in week two of our unit master's program. And week one, we learned about the internet of value and future predictions today, or actually in this week, we are looking to um, analyze the ecosystem from a bird's perspective. So in your assignments, in the coaching session, we talked about the different stakeholder ecosystem players. And our speaker today will give us a strategic outlook on what the future holds. Um, and then next week, we're looking into more technical details of governance, blockchain consensus mechanism. So that will come. So all the technical questions you can ask our um, two mentors next week. And this week, we're looking very much into the more strategic, holistic overview of the market, the infrastructure of the different stakeholder eco um, players in the ecosystem. So you will have your survey up and then our speaker is here. I have to make him a co-host. <laughs> and Nitin, okay. the stage is all yours to share your screen. Please don't feel rushed. We have booked you for 45 minutes. Perfect. So okay. you can no, take perfect. as much time as you need. Thank you so much. And uh, again, yep, it was really good to see you at South by Southwest. A quick introduction in addition to what you've mentioned. Uh, yes, IBM is an old company. In fact, I was at Avalanche Conference and I mentioned to somebody that I work for IBM, even though I've been doing this for a decade now. And her response was, which make me, you know, make me think was, oh, you work for a Web2O company. And uh, it was certainly an interesting comment only because, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in terms of early days of consensus research, where does this go in distributed computing, the challenges of scalability, what we all know as trilemma. I spent about eight years in figuring out the low level details. So in addition to my work at IBM, both in terms of looking into digital asset research, looking into the fundamental elements of what is changing the industry, I also run investment firm. Uh, it's called Portal Asset Management. I also do a regular podcast in terms of understanding the industry, making sense of it. Uh, both in terms of, again, the intertwined nature of how the industry evolves. Blockchain, Web3.0 uh, becomes sort of the technology foundation. Uh, so there's a lot of content, there's a lot of work, but I want to make sure that, you know, we're addressing this in a sense where you're able to take the framing of how, you know, I looked at the world in terms of classifying the asset classes, because as you can understand that when we, when I joined this whole process in IBM, I, I founded Blockchain Labs in 2012, 2013, and it was fairly simple. Life was really good in that we only had Bitcoin. We, Ethereum was emerging. And we, you know, many of us looked into hyperledger fabric. We had three foundational elements and our, our three came, you know, came along. Life was simple. Uh, it was not complicated. Uh, today, uh, there are close to about 340 projects popping up on a single, on a, on a day by day basis. So there's a lot of complexity, both in terms of how do you stack them? How do you place them? How do you classify them? So my attempt here is to just give a flavor of my thinking. Um, and again, I don't think anybody in the industry can claim complete expertise. If they do, they're probably lying because this is such a vast space, both in terms of understanding the lower level technology, but also understanding the economic models that's emerging from the space. Uh, in addition to my role at IBM, I also get pulled into by the regulators, which is SEC, CFTC, the entire sort of college of regulators in the alphabet soup. So uh, it's quite uh, interesting front row seats that you get in advising uh, both SEC, CFTC, and the, the European central banks, the, the role of central bank digital currency. So there's a lot happening in this space, but I'll quickly distill down to just the basic elements. And please feel free to ask me any questions, happy to share what I've learned over the years. Um, you know, we look into, we talk about asset tokenization, and I think uh, I prepared this deck for this, not, uh, you know, assuming that we all know what tokenization is, but my primary element was <clears throat> that it's, it's not new. Tokenization is not new. And, and if, if all we're doing is, is sort of creating a digital manifestation of 
the existing world, then we're simply digitizing uh, sort of the you know uh, the ecosystem. So the question then becomes, what is what is it, right? For example, whether you look at uh, the tokens that are NFT or token that actually represent physical goods, uh, it's it's a process of converting an asset to a right or a claim. Whether the asset is a induced asset, which is an asset that that most people like in terms of you know central bank uh, digital currencies, stable coins, gold, silver, diamond commodities as opposed to an asset that comes from a crypto economic system because that actually has a valuation mechanism. And the reason why I'm breaking this down, guys, is because I always ask my question and I spend a lot of time in an investment firm. We have built a lot of AI models, which is what I was talking to Yip about, is what gives token its value? So when, when you look at tokenization of assets, I look into token economic systems, I look into uh, the crypto economic systems, the ecosystems on layer one, the ecosystems on layer two, the problems of layer two are solving the risks that layer two impose on that ecosystem, but also it's quite challenging to value NFTs. So while we all are, I'm, I'm pretty good with the NFT ecosystem. So I go back to the basics. I go back to what are, what are you tokenizing? You know, what is what is what are you converting of an asset, whether it's a right of a claim or a digital representation of physical asset? What is it? Second thing I look for is what is the business in the sense that. Um, and again, you know, at South by Southwest and at Avalanche, you have some amazing and very interesting projects. But if I look at the valuation and some of the approach to the industry, I oftentimes go back to basics as, you know, evolution of who we are and, and, and how we came about is what is the business? And, and in the enterprise world, of course, we look at business in terms of, you know, how do we construct the understanding of exchange vehicles, which is the market structures and the market infrastructures. How do we look at settlement clearing system, which has enormous amount of inefficiencies? In fact, my team did research. There are 1,100 use cases in all of financial services industry, which today is costing us in about close to about a 1.2 trillion dollars in simple fees and costs. And so, to me, the 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 case that I make with regulated you know institutions is that even if I can solve 10, 15 percent of that problem, whether it's speed of settlement or removing some intermediaries that may have a cost structure, I'm good with that. But in the complete sort of opposite realm, which is again, the open networks and decentralized structures and decentralized models. The question that becomes is, you know, what are the valuation models? What's the exchange vehicles? Uh, what are the element of, you know, the, the challenges that interoperability imposes, which is the reason why you have things like wormholes and other, you know, vulnerabilities that we have seen over time. And those are still a bit clunky. And, and we begin to understand not just in terms of how does a token gets money, but also the business risk the technology risk, the protocol risk that these networks impose. Um, one last thing before I go to the next phase of what I want to talk about is the disruption. Uh, at the end of the day, and I've been writing about this for almost a decade, uh, is that uh, the you, the blockchain technology in you know in general is meant to disintermediate in the sense that you're the whole element of removing intermediaries, which is what internet had done for information intermediaries. Internet, you know, or in this case, blockchain aims to do that for value intermediaries. And banks and financial institutions and many of the other entities who are involved in uh, assuming a trust service on your behalf are, are financial intermediaries or value intermediaries who are involved in moving things for you and they charge a fee. And that fee oftentimes not only is a cost structure to the participants, but it, the fee is also some of the other you know, elements of, of the locked capital and, and inability for the ecosystem to be able to utilize those capital because they're locked in some you know, existing batch based systems. So that is a disruptive element of where things go with it. And so when I look at a project, I look at three fundamental elements before I go into the other esoteric business models or something which is something as abstract, is three fundamental elements. One, what is an asset? What, how does that asset derive its value? Second thing is the token itself. And, and this is where I go back into token economic models. I'm working on a thesis now which explores the pitfalls as well as the advantages of a one token model, two token model, and three token models. and and the risks that you impose when you go after changing a token economic model, which we have seen many projects sort of evolve over time. And if you have not looked into it, I strongly recommend you look into um, as to if a token is, is valued at a certain point, is that a governance token? Is that an actual token as a utility token, which is a layer one token? Or is it a token that represents some asset in the ecosystem, like an Axie Infinity, for instance, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, is, is as, a, as a result of uh, the ecosystem involvement? And then the process itself. This is where we look into layer one, uh, you know, Solana, Cardano, Avalanche, 
uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and some of the other you know technologies in terms, terms of what's the process of converting rights into an asset, what's the digital rights management element of it, and more importantly, what are the risks that goes with it. Uh, having built, I would say, about five payment networks in my life uh, on blockchain, uh, one of them was Worldwire, which we didn't go live with, but I built that on Stellar, and there are a few NFT projects that I'm working on at the moment. I think this process becomes more and more valued as we look into either as an investor in some of these investment companies, but also looking at, um, you know, looking at the technology and its pitfalls, because in many cases, I believe that uh, if you look at Solana and Ethereum at a technical level, I believe Solana is much more suited for financial applications and Ethereum for NFTs. But if you look at the growth of ecosystems, they are sort of swapped out in the sense that you find Solana ecosystem is very rich on NFT projects as opposed, and DeFi is still emerging Whereas Ethereum is sort of the, the, the lion's share of all the DeFi projects on, on Ethereum. And there are reasons I'm happy to go into why I'm you know, coming to that conclusion after you know, looking into this for quite some time. So the question I also look at is, you, know, you may have gone to conferences and I'm, even in this, every conference, we start seeing this amazing numbers. Uh, this conference, the number was uh, $700 trillion worth of economy will run on blockchain. The number that I have from some of the analysis, I have done some of the think tanks, it's 2.4 quadrillion dollars. So where do we get these numbers from? And this one slide sort of talks to that, that if you look at the sum total of all the cash from central banks, all the gold and silver, which is the commodities, all the assets, which is basically the asset, the bankable assets, as we call them, stocks, bonds, your collateral, your home as a collateral, your mortgage backed securities, all these collectively today amount to about $470 trillion or so. But what, we are trying to do in the blockchain ecosystem is trying to, again, look into things like intellectual property, things like the ability for me to monetize my identity, uh, the ability for me to monetize my healthcare record. And if, if my identity, my healthcare record could be a, could be a non-fungible token, can I not monetize those? And this is, I think, you know, where I have written on future of work that many of these blockchain ecosystem become, you know, have a nation state status where each layer one is trying to attract talent and capital. Uh, and, in, in, and encourage participation from all over the world, the question becomes, what are these non-bankable assets that you cannot, like today, you know, existing banking models and existing banking structures simply do not have the risk models to lend and borrow and do all those financial primitives. Whereas in the world that is emerging with blockchain DLT and the NFT and DeFi and, and Web3.0, it's embarking on participation, it's embarking on your ability to be able to bring your talent changing the way we work in future that you don't like. And I think Gitcoin is a perfect example that you can go to Gitcoin and take some of those projects and contribute to the project without actually having, having, a, you know, without a, uh, having a traditional sort of a work structure that goes with it. So those things are fundamentally changing the way we work. The artists are relying upon their ability to monetize their own work without intermediaries, whether the artist is a painter, musician, uh, folks who are intellectual capital, they're, they're monetizing the space in terms of, so all those are non-bankable assets, which is where we begin to see these massive numbers. And I think that not only the fact that you see these numbers because of the unlocked capital, but I also think that the exponential numbers are there simply because that this is a new sort of economic model that's emerging, new jobs are being created, new skills are being required, which to me is like super exciting that when I talk to people like Yip and her team, uh, I see such an amazing sort of energy in terms of their ability to create things and not have to rely on a large corporation to say, hey, you know, we, you know, we, we're going to be selective about, about who we hire and what we do. In this case, you have complete autonomy to be able to pick your ecosystems, pick your projects, explore your talents and figure out where you excel and monetize that, that, you know, that talent. And, and over time, you're building your own credit rating, you're, build, you're building your own reputation which I envision a future where my asset classes, my wallet can be also become sort of a ability for me to be able to borrow money in tokenized form on my own reconnaissance, which is what we do today with FICO scores and credit scores and so on and so forth. And that's the world I envision. And that is essentially the genesis of all the projects that they're trying to solve is going after that this huge part of market that is largely unexplored. But I go back to and uh, this one slide, the two slides that are the next two slides, I think, are the heart of my conversation with the uh, before I came on to this, is how do you make sense of this all? And this is my version of multiple layers. There are different thought leaders in the space who have explored this. They talk about different layers, and the reason why I do this is because I think it's important for us to understand where which project you're working on, 
what is the risks that go with it? What are the layers that fit into? And in this case, I could add a layer zero, I could add a layer five, but this sort of gives you the crux of it. And layer one, as you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Solana, Cardano, Avalanche, they're all layer one protocol. They are foundational trust transaction systems. They provide the basic core element of settlement uh, at a very basic level. And if you were to go down to layer zero, these are the infrastructure providers, the block demons of the world, people who are sort of providing the decentralized storage, compute, interconnect, the true sort of basic building blocks of Web3 or as we see it. So layer one is essential because they provide, and because of the fact that each layer one is emerging with their own specialization, and hopefully next week when you talk about uh, you know, consensus mechanism, spend some time on it. I mean, I spent literally about six or seven years, went through 17 different consensus mechanisms and their strengths and the weaknesses. Uh, to me, it, we should not take that lightly. I think anybody who's in DLT space, at least a technical level, should at least make an attempt to understand uh, the, the various building blocks of consensus mechanism, their strengths and the weaknesses, because the trilemma you know, is still an impeding problem. And while layer two are trying to solve it, uh, you are sort of turning the knob from security to scale. And when you achieve scale, you're giving up on security. When you achieve security, you're giving up on scale. And so then the question becomes what you're trying to achieve in the middle of the ground sort of uh, you know, scenario, which is what layer two protocols are trying to do. And then comes layer two protocol, which again, it relies on layer one, where you look into optimization, scale security. Then you begin to look at things like channelization or, 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 or payment channels, Latin networks, zero knowledge proofs, trying to solve the issue that layer one cannot. But here's the kicker, right? If, if many of you are keeping up with the Ethereum ecosystem, Ethereum is going through a massive change, which started four years back. We all were involved in understanding what does it mean to move the modified proof of work they have now to a, a, a DPOS system or proof of stake system. So fundamentally, they are changing technology in the flight, which I think is at a technical level is a brilliant sort of DevOps uh, type work that the team is doing in, in sort of moving the entire ecosystems one shot at a time to the newer model. But to me, it also indicates at a pragmatic level uh, risk in the sense that there's technology risk, there's economic risks, that you have earned tokens through one economic system and you suddenly moving that token to a different economic system. Uh, so when you move economic system, the interests, the again, these networks are trying to are, you know, in my opinion, have a nation state status when you're attracting amazing talent and people and capital. And if those ecos if those economic models are not in conducive to the participation, then you begin to see people fleet, you know, fleeting to other sort of networks, right? They're moving to other networks and they're trying to be able to. And so every, every layer one is competing for all of your work, all of your attention, all of your talent. And so that's layer two protocol, which also means that if I'm looking at, let's say, for example, Arboretum or looking at, at Polygon, what is the value of the token? So if they're, if they're able to achieve a token at a fraction of a cost of what Ethereum does, well, of course, they're batching these transactions and they're, you know, if, if one transaction on Ethereum cost me $100 and it cost me one cent on Polygon, well, at some point we have to understand what are we giving up at, at layer two level? What are the risks at layer two level? And many projects like, for example, you know, wormholes or as, as the most recent one or the, what you may have seen with, with, with polychain network. These were because of the fact that the layer one, layer two interface was not very well understood and, and there was an exploit. So I spend, I, you know, for those who are technical and those who are you know, business leaders and on this call, take time to understand those risks because there are a lot of euphoria in these sort of communities who are building these networks because they have investments or they have, they have invested the talent. But I think we have to be a bit more pragmatic in understanding the interface between the two. And then comes layer three, which to me is begin to look into applications. Uh, and I draw this analogy with the evolution of internet back in the day that you look at ERC-20 fiat services, which is stable coins and CBDCs and identity services like Civic. These are all begin to now uh, sort of normalize the application of blockchain without hiding all the complexity of blockchain underneath the covers. Um, so if, if you look at, again, you know, USDC, USDT, the stable coins, you look at many of the ERC-20 projects, these are all providing application services relying upon transaction layer of layer one, relying upon scalability and, and security in some cases of layer two, and providing you with something which is unique uh, add, as an interconnected, intertwined network. But the reason why I'm saying some of these things is because also because of the fact that uh, any risk in layer one eventually will percolate its risk all the way to layer three. 
And industry has tried to solve the problem in, in, in many different ways where USDC has had their own APIs. They're able to uh, sort of, you know, this is the circle project, which is you, you should be able to move your stable coin tokens from Stellar Network to Ethereum Network or vice versa without going through a Polkadot or Cosmos like interoperability projects. So they have solved that issue at the application layer. So many of these projects are saying like, you know, should we put all our basket in Ethereum versus staying open because let's say this shift that we're going towards Ethereum 2.0, if that imposes a risk, many of the layer three projects are agnostic or they would like to be agnostic of layer two, layer three. So they're trying to hedge their risks in saying, let's also have this project and let's have some mechanism of application level interoperability. Looking at this now for gosh, you know, nine months to a year where these are the Amazons of crypto world. So if you look at Amazon, after almost 30 years of evolution of internet, um, build an amazing company, the hide, you know, complexity of supply chain, payments, freight forwarding, tracking, they do all of that. So all you do is go to Amazon, you buy something and, and they manage the end-to-end -end process behind the scenes. So it took them about 30 plus years for evolution of internet, for them to be able to connect the dots and find these different services. And so whoever is in layer four, in my opinion, will be the ultimate winner uh, in this space only because they're actually providing real business value services. So if you look at yield farming, for example, that's a perfect example of what yield farming is doing, essentially finding the layer one networks, finding the projects, figuring out which is the best yield you can get, applying technology in terms of algorithmic trading and so on and so forth. So some of those projects are industry consortium led projects. They are creating cross services across trust layers. Uh, they are give, you know, giving you security token exchanges and so on and so forth. And that's utilizing layer three protocol. So I can imagine a composability element in layer four, where if I want to build a DeFi application, I take identity, I take some of the element of staking protocols, I take some of the element of security tokens and build an application that makes sense to the common people. And, and to me, layer four will eventually be the ultimate winner in this case, while we are still building layer two, layer one, and removing the crinks from it. You know, from it. Uh, just like what we had seen early days of, of the, you know, what here's layer zero, which is still on TCP IP protocol and so on and so forth. So it's a lot to digest. I wrote a whole paper on this topic, diving into it and figuring out as to who at what layer, who's commercializing, how are they making money? And uh, what I have here on the, on the, on the right-hand side, you'll find that uh, the monetization, you know, or what we call as blockchain protocol commercialization is based on whether it's a token-based model, whether it's token as a medium of exchange, which is what we see with stable coins, commercialization of protocol itself, which is using them as a technology services, which is what you see Polygon. Polygon has raised half a billion dollars and now they're going out to providing services to the enterprise. Avalanche has subnets for enterprises. These are all commercializing technology. And then you have the power of network, which is the network effect, which is the bread and butter of our industry, where we rely upon big communities, massive sort of intake of new people coming in, new skills, new capital. So these are the ways that each or each layer has its own thesis of how they want to be able to build uh, sort of the ecosystem and how they want to monetize the space and building community around it. I'll take a short pause. I don't know what's the what's the protocol here, uh, Yip, for Q and A, or should I continue till the end? Uh, I'll I'll wait for your you know guidance here. Yeah. So in in general, people when they have questions, they ask them in the chat, and I read them out. I think for now, let's um, continue until the end of your session so that everyone has a holistic understanding of your storyline and your key takeaways yeah. so that then we can ask targeted questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So, so this was the, this was generic layer. And if you look at TCP IP itself, they have seven layer protocols. And that, that is my inspiration for doing this work and I'm trying to dissect and decompose the industry. But so this is the, the overall technical stack of how things are done and how tokens are monetized. Then I looked into verticals. So if you look at blockchain in general, DeFi is a vertical, NFT is a vertical, identity is a vertical. You find this big, you know, these verticals who are popping up as their own ecosystems and they have their own layering. And this is also important. For example, uh, you begin to view settlement layer, for example, Ethereum, Bitcoin, in my opinion, are true crypto settlement entities, which means that whether, and this is why I joined this entire sort of movement in 2012, 2013, is if you have an ether and you're in the United States and you have ether, you're in, you're in Vietnam and you have an ether, you're anywhere in the world, the rules of engagement and the access to investment opportunities is exactly the same no matter where you are in the world. So you're truly leveling the playing field of the space. And if Ethereum Bitcoin becomes universally accepted, which we are inching in that direction, 
for instance, layer one protocols, which provide the ultimate transaction finality, then they become sort of recognized instruments of settlement. And you can rely, you can see then as to how you're sort of leveling the playing field on that front. And then they become things of value, which means that, that the reason why Bitcoin is, 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 uh, is so high or, and, and, you know, what we'll begin to look into is it's a settlement instrument, but also, you know, it's a store of value. So that's one protocol that becomes a part of, of DeFi. I'm using a DeFi because a lot of DeFi, whether it's collateralization, lending, borrowing, all the financial primitives start at this layer at some point. And that's, we begin to see a lot of that industry in, in the TVL statistics and metrics that we look at. Second thing is digital assets. So if you look at crypto native assets, which is, again, when I say crypto native, these are assets that are born from crypto economic systems, not necessarily from an external uh, asset linkage or creating from a crypto economic models. And then you have ERC20, NFTs, fungible tokens. These become sort of a big classification. And I begin to now classify them because a token is a token is a token. Uh, but the way we value the risk is should be different for these things. And that's why now I have, a, for my investment, I have now 17 categories of different digital assets and different industries, just like what we do for our existing world that we live in. You have retail, you have transportation, you have travel and tourism, you have defense and aerospace. These are all different industry groups that the industry has created as a classification system for us to be able to make sense of the correlation of risk that happened between different industries, which means that if, if there's a risk in one industry, what's the understanding of the impact of the risk or the correlation of the risk with other sort of classification of that system? And that is why it's important for you to understand that not all digital asset tokens have the same element. It's really, really important for us to classify this Coindesk had a DAX, which is a digital asset classification system, similar to what in the traditional finance, the Bloombergs uh, have created. I, for my financial service industry, have created my own only because that's one way to lead and one way to sort of understand uh, and grasp the industry by, you know, by its horns. Then you begin to look into DeFi applications. These are applications that you may have seen with decentralized exchanges, collateralized debt positions like Maker, Uniswap, SushiSwap. You begin to see synthetics. The Terra Labs have looked into creating a fraction of a Tesla token, as you may have seen, uh, digital securities, they become applications where they also have a token economic model, which relies upon a traditional corporation of saying, hey, if you're a token holder, you're going to get paid out based on the DEX transaction volumes and, and so on and so forth. The collateralized debt position, which is the make or die, for example, has a two token model. They look into over collateralization, which is, which in my opinion, has some challenges with capital efficiency and so on and so forth they become DeFi application and they actually have a role, but you cannot create those lending liquid derivatives and so on and so forth till you have a better understanding of the various classification of asset classes that you begin to see in this case. So it's really important for you to understand that while DEX may have a token, the value of the token is different from let's say an ERC20 token than let's say a Bitcoin, while they all are talked in the same breath in the investment circles. Uh, so oftentimes I begin to now look into besides the, what gives token a value, social intelligence, you know, social intelligence metrics. There's a project called Luna, uh, which, um, you know, uh, or Luna Crush actually, which looks into social int intelligence because a lot of these token valuation and, and prices are driven by memes and driven by a lot of social, uh, so, you know, sort of uh, interaction. I begin to factor that in, in my valuation mechanism. Now I also begin to factor in using crypto MISO as to how active are these projects. So if you're looking at this, uh, and I'll give an example of Doge, which is certainly a meme-driven project. For the longest time, Doge had was inactive for five to six years, which means if there's no code going into it, if people are not contributing their intellectual capital, then where does it get its value from, right? And that's why I think it's important for you to understand the various types of DeFi applications and what are the metrics you look into that. And then you have the niche and sophisticated services, which is where I'm sitting here uh, with fund management, non-custodial finance, yield aggregation protocol, which is again, you know, there's a whole new movement now that I'm involved in where we are trying to build a VC type activity and creating a DAO, which is investment DAOs. And we've seen a bunch of those DAOs that have pop up where, so those are sort of niche and sophisticated services, which are trying to utilize the same thesis, same fundamentals of what blockchain does. And again, reducing cost and making it more attractive to the digital, native community who are you know most of us here and and the newer ecosystem that goes with it and what you see on the right hand side is our traditional vc funded companies these are providing support services they don't have token structures but if you look at for example chain analysis trm labs uh, fireblock and 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 copper these are companies who are serving the industry but they don't have a token model 
in my opinion, these are true Web3 companies because they are trying to understand the protocol. They are also, if you have read um, Moxie Model and Spike's sort of a nice post on this topic to say, I don't think any of us are going to run servers in our in our basement or in a garage because we all want to be part of Web3. But you have block demons of the work. You have a lot of these companies who are emerging trying to understand the need of this industry and giving you the scaffolding and the right structures that will support the industry going forward. And that's why I use the word adjacent support services. Um, so this is DeFi stack. I have similar stack for NFTs, similar stack for other areas. Again, trying to understand who's who, how do I put them in which bucket, which makes, you know, and again, it's a complicated task. I Just to give you a perspective, I did an exercise four months back. I had eight categories. Now I have 17 categories in four months. That's how fast this industry moves. And which means that, you know, there's no sort of sleeping around, you know, the whole thing, you have to be in constant touch. I have some con context around Web3.0, I'll discuss this, but I just want to give you uh, some of the data work that my team had done. This is the investment part. We looked in technical indicators of tokens. So uh, imagine this, right? I'm, I'm switching gears here. So just stay with me for a minute on this. While I classify these things, I look into DeFi classification. So now suddenly in my universe, uh, there are close to 15,800 different tradable tokens around the world. There are close to 300,000 tokens, but not all of them are tradable. So let's clarify that piece. There are about 15,000 tokens. So we begin to look into applying data, applying AI and machine learning. And I've always felt that it's easy to do that in blockchain world because data is easily available. Data is free. You don't need anybody's permission. And that's those are some of the advantages of blockchain in general. So we begin to look at that, those data trends and volatility and momentum. And this looks like a fuzzy chart, but we took sort of, uh, I did classification for my fund and I classified each token, its correlation with, with another token. And this may not make sense, but I'll give you a perspective that I have a classification of like portal based assets, portal NFTs, portal is a company, portal asset management is, is, is a fund manager, portal layer one. So these are all a classification of layer one diversification, broad industry, web trio as one of the classification criteria, And I begin to find correlations. And the reason why this is important is let's say NFTs today it's at a certain phase, but it exponentially takes off. Well, if you're true NFT, you should be using decentralized storage like Filecoin. You should be using scale. You should be using, uh, you know, for analysis, you should be using graph GRT tokens. Uh, so as NFTs and as the storage requirement of token goes up, if you don't see a blip or you don't see a exponential rise in Web3.0 projects, well, to me, that's a red flag because where are these people storing their content? What is the real model around the whole thing? So you begin to see this. So if you see the correlation, the correlation with NFT and Web3.0 is 0 0.95. So it's a one-to-one, -one, which means that if NFT goes up, Web3.0 goes up. And likewise, if you look at diversified, I had diversified portfolio, which included layer one, layer two, all the four layers that you saw, compare that with purely NFT markets, the correlation is very low, which is true because NFTs and, and DeFi are not exactly correlated yet until we get to the point where NFT becomes financialized, which is, again, the industry is looking at that at some level. This is a non-bankable uh, st story that I was pitching to you all early on. So this exercise helped me navigate the investment landscape to say, hey, if we are doing this, one, I can make a choice on either going all diversified because I want to hedge my bets and hedge my risk, or if I have the conviction as a fund manager to say, hey, I'm going all in on DeFi because I understand it, I have strong convictions, then I go all in DeFi because this helps me, this helps me understand what is the, you know, how based on the classification that I have, how does the industry sort of go forward with? Um, and 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 again, um, so that's one thing that I use, and I have much more detailed data models. Uh, I don't know if I have that handy. Uh, in terms of, I don't know if handy yet, but I, I do have a spreadsheet which looks into the 17 different classific, you know, you know uh, categories, which most recently I added gaming and gaming NFTs and gaming tokens and, and governance tokens and content tokens. So it's it's just becoming hard to keep up with the amount of tokens that are coming out and not many of them are exactly mature, but we have to continue studying them. I'll pause after this slide because there's a lot of content and I just won't want to be able to answer questions. So Web3 to me is, is real. And I, I think I posted a, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I, I do regular weekly podcast and understanding this, trying to understand this industry uh, in terms of, you know, the Web3 and how do we do business? So Metaverse is, in my opinion, quite misunderstood. It's related to gaming. It's related to, to Second Life, uh, which is basically a virtual environment. And I believe that 
the virtual environment, the VR, AR are all modalities. These are all the ways we interact with metaverse. But in my definition of metaverse, which is I, I spend quite some time in figuring out how do we do business in metaverse? Because while you have all these gamings happening is ability for me to take my prized sword as a gamer and ability for me to convert into a tokenized security in future implies that I traverse through multiple universes, multiple layered ones, implies that I have bridges, implies that I have some exchanges. So ability for me to take a sword in a gaming environment or ability for me to be able to spend my tokenized synthetic security like Tesla to buy coffee and converting Tesla into cash and converting cash into, into settlement uh, is metaverse in its true sense. Now, if you want to do it as a virtual reality, that's a modality. Uh, and, I, and, and I think that, that you know, when you look at what, what JPMC did in having a lobby, well, having a lobby in metaverse does not imply you can open a bank account, you can do all these things. But I would like to get to a world that I would like to use my identity token to be able to do all the regulated in, in, in terms of identity, open an account and do all these things without actually having to go into a sort of a virtual lobby of sorts. So there's a lot of things evolving in that space. I think we should stay tuned, it's real. I think it has a lot of potential and it has a lot of element around non-bankable asset, which I think is fantastic. So I'll pause here. Um, I could go on for all day, as you know, I love to talk about this topic. So I'd love to get your questions and, and happy to answer them and provide a perspective. I can totally feel your passion through the screen. It's just amazing. So thank you very much for this very um, dense, like rich in content session. This is a lot of um, value to digest. Maybe a, a very, like you know, simple question, but very probably very difficult to answer is what? How does this future actually look like? The metaverse, like how far are we away from that metaverse future in your view? Yeah, so I think we are like you know seven to ten years away from that, um, and, and I, I say that with a lot of conviction too. Um, one because Gavin Wood on Polkadot and Cosmos and many of us in even the enterprise space looking into bridging. So the two things, right? One is, uh, again, the dichotomy of decentralization versus quasi-decentralization is important to understand that you still have some intermediaries who will provide some services. Not everything's gonna be, you know, I'm not drinking the decentralization Kool-Aid in its entirety yet. Second thing is that until we create a seamless trust, so the, the fact that you're trying to sell a sword, in my example, for example, to buy a tokenized security, from anywhere in the world, because these are all global systems and Ethereum, Bitcoin, Solana, these are all truly nation state status that they are truly global systems. Uh, so as long as you can find to an ecosystem in single layer one, it's easy. But when you're looking at multiple layers, which, which is providing their own specialization, their own ecosystem, their own sort of specialization, then you will need something to be bridged between all of the ecosystems. Well, the bridging happens at two layers. One is at the application level, which implies centralization, example of USDC. The other is protocol level, which means I use something like Polkadot or asset bridging technologies to be able to lock an asset, create another asset and make it such seamless that I don't really have to worry about. I simply trust the system to say, I don't know who you are yet. You may be in Vietnam, I may be in, 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 in India and I should be able to transact that with you with implied trust in the system. So that trust is what is to me the entire element of ZKP or the family of zero knowledge proves the security layer of 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 of, of internet or of uh, of Web three O is such an important part that we cannot get to that stage till we find a solution to this at one to solve the problem. Second thing to solve it at economically viable level in the sense that encryption is very very expensive on mining. Encryption is very very expensive on resource usage and power usage. Uh, which means that you can have all the amazing, you know, security element, which we've seen that in Bitcoin, but it's quite expensive and it's not scalable. Um, and so the question then becomes is how much investment are willing to put it and can we do it at a cheaper, cheaper level, cheaper scale. So to me, it's yeah, a five seven year journey in, in that respect, I think. Thanks a lot. You mentioned already earlier also, we still as an industry or as a society have to solve the identity, yes. <laughs> like the identity challenge. What are currently, like what's the latest stage of the industry? You get all these deal flows, so you know what are like, you know, the current solutions that try to address identity. How does identity of the future look like, like the most viable version of it? Yeah, no, uh, to me, uh, you, you stole what I was gonna say. I think identity to me is the single <laughs> most important problem in the industry today. 
I had 160 wallets, which I'm assuming many of you do too, because we're all experimenting, we're all doing it, and half of them you lose password because you're not serious about them. You're trying to figure out who, what's what's going on in the space. My ideal element is in Metaverse, let's look at the Web3 or real context Metaverse. My representation is tokenized form of Nitten. So, which means that my tokenized form of identity, identity construct should be, I should be able to go to any of the universes, whether it's Solana universes, or, you know, or, or popular universe, and they should know who I am. And with, with impunity, which means with non-repudiation, like you go to an ATM, you withdraw money, you cannot say you don't do it because there are enough, there are enough checks and controls to say, hey, it was you, you had the pen, you had the card, we have a photo of you. you, you can't say no to that. So with non-repudiation is the term that financial industry uses to be able to go into any of these to say, hey, this is me, this is who I am. And they should verify your identity and you should be able to do business in those just like you do business with your passport physically in, you know, in the physical world. Um, so digital identity is a single most issue in absence of which interoperability becomes even more difficult because now I'm dealing with multiple wallets and dealing with issuing and, and all the EVM compatible elements with MetaMask, for example, provides a avenue, but MetaMask is not exactly the most secure thing and it's still managed by a single entity. The question then becomes, what is that? So there are a few projects, for example, I met Sandy Carter at South by Southwest. She's leading this uh, un unstoppable domains, which again gives me, a, it's still ether, ether focused, but it's basically, you have a name. It's like you have DNS, like IBM as a company has IBM.com, for example, or jpmc.com or, or you know, chase.com, which identifies a company. But what if I could have nitin.eth or nitin.crypto, or you could have yip.eth and you could go anywhere else and they could say, let me just call using a cross, cross chain protocol, verify that this is nitin. And once the verification is done, then pro proceed with the transaction of buying, selling, and doing business, or whatever the, ca the case may be. That to me is the single most. So, if I were to, and I, as you know, I'm, I'm leaving IBM by the end of the month. And as we discussed early on, if there are aspiring entrepreneurs in the space, I think there's very little coming out of identity. There's a lot of token projects, an easy one, and games and NFTs, a lot are happening in that space. And they're all relying upon volatile structure, wallet providers. I think that if any uh, budding entrepreneurs on this call who have any interest in digital identity is to me one of the most important sort of challenges of our times in this space um, and these are the these have been my focus my personal focus in the past six years they continue to be my focus areas of creating an ultimate settlement instrument looking into the technology which, which create asset organization so I'll, I'll stop here you have to see if that makes sense Thanks so much. Sonia is asking any kind of ETA for that digital identity solution. Like how far are we away? Are we still like super early stage or is that something that will be developed probably over the next few months, few years? So I don't think it's few months, Sonia. I think, so if you look at the stack here, right? Until this stack reaches a critical mass, uh, which I think the industry today is 2.2 trillion or whatever the, you know, the number is from that perspective. But till we reach a critical mass where right now they all are very heavy on like for example a lot of 90 percent of all value-based tvl stuff is happening on ether um which means that if you are if you have a identity construct on ether you're fine you can still do a lot of on the ecosystem until you begin to see that value sort of balance itself out on the avalanche and solana and cardano and and now some of the smart contract frameworks building upon bitcoin for example so when you begin to see the value sort of balance out that is it's no longer heavy on ether because ether was to me it's time to market there'll be many more amazing tech many more layer one come, come to come to play i think then you'll find the need for the industries and there'll be a push for the industry to say hey we need to build some standardized mechanism that we all understand as identity construct because that will benefit everyone all the ecosystems right now i think every layer one and layer two are going to build massive communities and attract more and more people the need has not arisen yet that even if you go and build one you'll be ahead of your time, which is why you should do it. Uh, but the intake will be uh, will be just minimal to two or three different, which is still significant, I think, if that makes sense. Okay. And now I think we're wrapping up with the final question from Noi. Noi asks, if you're not a dev, how can you actually understand whether a layer one or two protocol has a solid tech? What are the parameters to look at? Yeah. So I look at a few things, right? I look at uh, the few fundamental tenets and that's a great question because 90 percent of people in the space are not technical by the way uh, at least in my in interaction and that's okay because we all bring skill, skill set we all bring mindset we all bring our resources and not everybody needs to have a technical background i think and the techies will automatically me and my team are techies we automatically are, are, are gravitating towards the space 
look into trade trust ownership as three fundamental tenants. So what are you trading? This is the asset tokenization technology. What is the consensus mechanism? Uh, and I can give you some perspective on consensus where you have, basically you have three main pillars of consensus and all the consensus fit into those three pillars. Understand uh, what those are. I, I'll give you, a, uh, you have a session next week, but there's a single uh, leader, no leader and multi-master model. And all basically there are three different buckets. And no matter what consensus system you have in the world, they fit into one of those three buckets. And if you understand the tenets of the bucket, that means you don't have to become an expert in let's say delegated proof of stake. But if you know which bucket it is, you know the inefficiency of that consensus mechanism or the strength of the consensus mechanism. So that's the, the trust part of it. Trade trust ownership. Ownership is the identity piece of it, is, is to define a claim of an asset with non-repudiation on the network. So I would look at that as three sort of base level tenants. And even in most blockchain system have four, no matter what blockchain system you have, they have four comp components. They have a consensus mechanism. They have a distributed database. Uh, they do have a smart contract in infrastructure and they have cryptography. These four things is universal to no matter what layer one you look at. And basically, if you combine the two, the three buckets that I mentioned, and these four boxes, uh, then I think you're in good shape to at least classify it as a, hey, what is the cryptography they're using, which is, if they're not using elliptical curve or non-standardized, then that's a problem because, you know, that's not proven yet. And you're not, peer, this is at a science level, everything that happens in computer science level has to be peer reviewed by your peers. So they know what, what's good, what's bad. If it's not peer reviewed technology, then it's a risk. It may be good, but it's a risk because we don't know what we don't know. Um, and same thing with databases. If your database is not scalable and there's tons and tons of literature, you don't have a database expert, just understand if it's commonly used. I'll stop here. I, I could go on again for a long time for this. But <laughs> That's so amazing. We could book you for three days of content and we still would not have like understood everything in, in, in detail. So we have built this unit masses for six weeks. So you guys don't freak out if you feel like, oh my God, so many new terms. I translated a few for you in in the chat and over the next um, eight speaker sessions we'll still have time to go over the different concepts with we'll coaching sessions you have your own study groups so you can talk with each other and support each other on your own learning journey nitin is publishing quite a decent number of really well written um, knowledge pieces everywhere nitin you have the white paper maybe i can ask you to share that with with me and i can share with the group and also a lot of articles on coin telegraph think financial times and so on and so forth so follow nitin on social media i just shared his linkedin and yeah okay. let's let's um stay all up to date i i think this is just like super impactful and you just heard in 45 minutes with somebody um, who spent 10 years in the ecosystem is trying to bring to us in like, you know, digestible manner. So, wow. Thank you so much, Nitin. <laughs> no, thanks for the invite. Uh, yep. Uh, sincerely appreciate it. And, and more, more the better. So thanks again for your time and hope something got off it, but connect with me on LinkedIn and, and people are asking for links. I publish everything on Coindesk or Coin Telegraph, and it's uh, shared through my Twitter and LinkedIn. So that's the best, easiest way to do it, I think. Okay. Thank okay. you all. And see you next week again for um, a talk with Vlad from Ethereum Foundation and then Kevin from Moonbeam. So it will be quite technical talks about governance yeah. of the future. So is Vlad, right. Vlad, Vlad Zemfer coming next week? Yeah, on Tuesday. You're oh, welcome yeah, to he's, join too. Yeah, he's, a, he's a cool guy. I'll, I'll join. I'll give him our time. But he's, he's really good. He's really good. <laughs> All right. I look forward okay. to that discussion. Bye, everyone. Have Bye. a good one. Thanks.